Western diaspora. How to assess the symbolic violence with the implicit agreement of victims. It is my key point. Uh -huh. I will uh, obviously take the perspective from sociology and phenomenology. Why? Because if we want to liberate people, we have to make themselves be liberated. We have to take into account their subjectivity, their agentivity, their awareness in the battle, the struggle for the liberation. In this issue of uh, churches, faith, religions, I think in putting emphasis on the process of subjectivation, both religious, philosophical, political, intellectual subjectivation, we will, for sure, we will get, like, find some operative strategies to the right people. And the second, uh, like, contestions I want to make in starting this uh, speech is, after 60 years of post-colonial leadership, post-colonial management of African societies, we have to acknowledge that grassroots people, eh? grassroots people, popular working class, react, are, are reacting, are facing the post-colonial crisis by in the religious field. Very important to know. Because without going far uh, by assessment the post-colonial era, we have to acknowledge that it is a disaster. Uh, why? Because the Western political epistemology of state doesn't work, didn't work in Africa. Even though we have state embassies, but for the grassroots people who is the majority, people react by going in traditional thought patterns. Uh, on the one hand, we, we see the, the superficial modernization of Africa, but in the same time, we are observing a strong process of retraditionalization. Re you know, for the grassroots people who are not uh, uh, exposed to Western epistemology, they react by the ancestral thought patterns and also by the religious sphere. And if, if some of you uh, uh, travel in Kinshasa, for example, uh, people spend their time in churches uh, because they don't have a job and uh, it is there who they, they try to manage their life. And we have to take into account this point. But now I can read my paper in remembering again this focus. Violence symbolique in French. I took this expression from Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist. Huh? Violence symbolique, symbolic violence. And he said the symbolic violence is, 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 is complex because it implies the tacit agreement of the victim. And to deal with this specific type of violence, one has first of all to deconstruct the mechanism of his formation. And after deconstructing this mechanism of formation of symbolic violence, we can find critical tools. And these critical tools is only to make aware the subject, the victim of this violence, that he has, she has, to fight for his subjectivation, for his awareness, for his awakeness. Because you can't liberate a slave or a victim without his own involvement in the liberation process. And even in this religious aspect, in this religious question in Africa where we find men églises du réveil, revival churches, it is an African version of Christianity, but these churches appear in the context of the failure of post-colonial states and also the failure of this politi uh, political, political and religious elite to deal with the needs, the basic needs of grassroots people. And my, 
my purpose, my solution, again, as I said, it is we have to empower the agency, the performativity of the subject, the subject who are victim of this manipulation. Because as you know, churches or religious uh, groups are composed by human beings, and human beings are limited, are fallible uh, sinners, but we have also in the same time be aware of the dynamic process of subjectivation. Uh, and also, especially because uh, without, uh, I wrote some books uh, in postcolonial issues, sometimes uh, Western scholars have some category of analysis and they project on African societies without, first of all, do a prerequisite job which consists in doing some sociological and phenomenological observation. Because tell me what is the tools you use to produce a knowledge, I will tell you how you will produce your knowledge. Eh? Because for even we go back to a colonial era or a slavery, eh? many movements of liberation tax support from religious mystical era. And we have to take into account this aspect when we are dealing with African issues. Now, I can start to read slowly my paper. Because of a biased, patriarchal, and non-rigorous interpretation of the gospel, many pastors of the African churches, Église du Réveil, Revival churches, both in Africa and Western diaspora, are destroying families by their marketable, and non-critical theological interpretation of the gospel. It is the reason why I put emphasis on this category of violence symbolic, because in this case, women are not like uh, abused by using physical violence, uh, or uh, by, uh, by undergoing uh, dress restrictions, but it is a mental issue now. Because human being is also, we, 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 don't, we have not to forget this basic ontological layer of our subjectivity. Eh? This inner layer of values. Values for which, for why we raise every morning and we go to do something. What is the reason? The values. I have to point out the collapse of post-colonial states and the aggravation of poverty and misery in contemporary African societies. This drastic failure of post-colonial leadership in African societies exacerbates the exploitation of Christian faith by some pastors who manipulate both men and women by extorting their money and committing sexual, psychological, and mental abuses. My main scientific and ethical goal is to demonstrate how symbolic violence, uh, violence symbolic from Pierre Bourdieu, uh, and this violence, we have to understand, is deeply as the invisible mechanism of mental enslavement in politics, religions, and sciences. In accord, my main scientific and ethical goal is to demonstrate how the symbolic violence implies the tacit, the implicit agreement of victims who are brainwashed by biased interpretations of the gospel for the sake of economic survival in the collapsed states of post-colonial Africa. Solution for this mental slavery requires the elaboration and the promotion of a critical, multidimensional, and liberating thinking by schools and main churches in Africa. For example, Catholic churches, mo most of Catholic churches and Protestants are doing a very good job, you know. Despite some uh, weaknesses, we have to acknowledge that from the colonial era until now, churches 
have uh, building schools and uh, you know formative uh, places to educate women uh, to increase the sensitivity both in domestic and public era. And these churches actually until now have been involved in the process of liberating process for women. And as I said, these uh, My main, okay, the, the, the goal of my intervention is to say that this violence symbolic implies the tacit agreement of victims who are brainwashed by biased interpretation of the gospel for the sake of economic survival in the collapsed states of post-colonial Africa. Solution for this mental slavery required the elaboration and the promotion of a critical multidimensional and liberating thinking by school and main churches in Africa. Because of why? Because of the pervasiveness of religious beliefs in African communities. Very important. It is a fact. And this fact we have to criticize. We have to, to, to start from there and to go beyond and far. Not to ignore that. A critical, deep, and rational practice of Christian churches and the education of women in Africa is a strong tool to fight successfully against the symbolic violence targeting women, but also men, in the Église du Réveil, both in Africa and Western diaspora. For example, in Kinshasa, Libreville, Brazzaville, Lagos, Cotonou, Dar Salaam, in many African capitals, women have to leave their husbands and children and go to work with full time to the church or for the pastor's needs or business. They go freely, they are not obliged, but how to explain this kind of obedience? Women have also to give money and sometimes we have cases of sexual abuses with the implicit agreement of brainwashed and enslaved women. My main issue is to raise the point of what Pierre Bourdieu calls violence symbolic domination masculine, hein, with the tacit consentment of the victim. The religious exploitation of women in African churches, both in the continent and Western diaspora, is has been exacerbated by the aggravation of post-colonial disaster. And, this case, and in this case, faith and religion become the means for corrupted and ignorant pastors to make money and to enslave and seduce women with the implicit agreement due to mental and recurrent manipulations. The same phenomenon is tremendously growing in African diaspora in Canada and many divorces are caused by this pervasive role of religion in African communities, where churches become place to reconstruct some kind of African atmosphere and to help each other by facing economic and socio-professional challenges of uncertain integration in Canada by facing economic and socio-professional challenges of uncertain integration in Canada. I have to acknowledge that Catholic and Protestant churches have achieved many success stories and realizations in the process of empowering, empowering women, of increasing women agency, both during colonial, as I said, and post-colonial era. For example, primary and high school, universities, social work, nurses, microfinances, etc. My final point as conclusion, what are the solutions to strengthen and to empower women agency? By women agency, as I already said, I want to mean and to put emphasis on the process of subjectivation, holistic subjectivation intellectual, political, social. 
because we have to consider human being as a whole. And it is a big challenge for our some dichotomy, epistemology of some uh, certain uh, Western positivism, you know, visible, invisible, and no communication. Because as we can observe uh, in each of human beings, we have some aspects that are visible, and some of them can't be visible. And they still exist, I feel. And subjectivity, it is awareness of the selves affectivity of the selves, the difference, ontological difference between a human being and machine is human being can, can feel himself by feeling others. And now I put a small inclusion in French, phenomenology, Michel Henry, phenomenology of what life, affectivity transcendental. For those who are considered, I, two months ago, I published my six book about philosophical, phenomenological, and theological deconstruction of Western modernity. Modernity is Western subjectivity. And I took support from Michel Henry, as Ousmane Balthazar, and Jean-Luc Marion, who was my director of thesis in Sorbonne in 2003, and who teach in Chicago. But I close it bracket because these uh, phenomenologists put emphasis on the process of donation, phenomenology of givingness and affectivity as one of the way to think about the process of our self, ipséité. No. And what are the conclusions? One, I try to summarize, to sum up in seven points before I finish my, my presentation. Number one, we have to maximize and promote human education to a critical and performative thinking that could increase the inner awareness of the selves as human beings. Because women are the first agents of their own liberation from this religious slavery I call symbolic violence, nobody can't liberate a slave without his conscious aware involvement. Second, because symbolic violence implies a tacit agreement of the victim through a persistent brainwashing process, we have to provide a strong critical tools to deconstruct the irrationality and introduce new forms of slavery in the Église du Réveil in Africa and Western diaspora. We can understand deeply the challenges of our black communities both in Africa and Western in avoiding, in escaping this massive parameter of religious issues. Three. For those who we travel in Africa eh, to achieve some professional projects, I encourage them to practice her, what Abermas called communicational rationality. You know, and it is uh, well appropriate in Africa where people talk, you know, they don't write enough, but they talk uh, spontaneously in orality. And uh, because uh, each form of uh, uh, knowledge, or writing, implies each form of subjectivity, you know, and temporality, because subjectivity means temporality, when the temporality affects fits in self, or self, which involves a deep sense of observation, discernment, and judgment, listening, and an anal analysis, before to apply our theories elaborated in Western thought patterns, one has to discuss deeply with African women and make them think by themselves about the insidious forms of slavery in their so-called revival churches. But I think we should call them sleeping churches. Or well, enslaving churches, not revival. It is opposite. Number four, we have to oppose convincingly theological and philosophical reasons to deconstruct and fight this irrational and marketable manipulations of Christians, both women and men. Nowhere in the Bible we authorize manipulation, exploitation, and enslavement of people, men or women, in the name of God. The best strategy to topple down this religious slavery due to the marketable exploitation of the gospel is to elaborate, as I already said, and promote a strong theological and philosophical thinking is like in theology of liberation, like in South America. 
The only way to overcome ignorance is to learn and to acquire substantial and liberating knowledge about religion, about theology, about God. I encourage African women to fill the gap of their like, theological, religious ignorance by reading. Even though we are all a society, we have to adjust ourselves in moderate. We can't, in this area of numeric globalization, we can't avoid right and process. And in New Testament, we, I have also to say to one, uh, when Jesus inaugurated his mission, he said, the spirit of the Lord lies upon me to announce the gospel to the poor and to liberate the slaves and the oppressed from the prisons. But if some people enslaved others by using the name of, of God, it is a business. It is not the orthodoxy. And we, it is uh, common in many uh, issues. And we have only to fight by using non-violent but rational means. Theologically speaking, it is not a law to use the name of God to enslave people. It is contradictory and a blasphemy. But given the fact that churches are composed by human beings, as I say, who are sinners and fibers, we have to remain awake and critical before any kind of irrationality and ideological exploitation of the gospel. The ultimate reason and purpose of any religion is to deal with the crucial question of the meaning of our lives in the world. Religious and philosophical aspects of our lives are part of our human condition because every human being remains an everlasting question for himself. What we have to fight are the marketable and ideological exploitations and manipulations of human beliefs. The collapse of the neoliberalism will intensify the interrogations about the meaning of our lives. Number five, given the range of post-colonial disaster, religious fundamentalism and manipulations will drastically increase throughout black African communities. And we have to prepare women, especially, but a strong education to acquire critical, visionary, and performative thinking that will uh, enable them to strengthen the awareness of the agentivity and subjectivity by facing several challenges of the daily life, both in Africa and Western societies. Six, we have been living in economy of knowledge, economy de savoir, and in all fields, included in a religious dimension of uh, which is prevailing in African cultures and societies, one has to work hard every day to acquire critical and reflective categories and thought patterns in order to topple down those new forms of service. <coughs> Finally, symbolic violence requires the promotion of strong critical and multidisciplinary thinking in order to empower intellectual and political subjectivation process. Only an individual who is aware of his agentivity, awareness, awareness, performativity of, of our subjectivity, can deal successfully in the deconstruction process of symbolic violence. This kind of violence interferes with the inner knowing structures of human subjectivity and consequently we have to use powerful intellectual and spiritual categories by deconstructing and overcoming them. We need, actually, philosophical and theological strategies of holistic liberation by fighting, fighting against the institutes and tragic form of religious enslavement based on ignorance of both sides. Ignorance, ignorant pastors and ignorant women who are enslaved institutionally, each of them. I have to make a And for those who, who read French, in the center I, uh, I am the president, every month we have a conference in Ottawa University, Saint the Senate, and every year we publish the Afroscopy. It is a leading uh, review, academic review, and lastly it was Leadership féminin, ou leadership, et action politique. 
le cas des communautés africaines du Canada, via Bof, French, Canadian, African, Women Who Write That. And uh, my uh, recent book, no, my fifth book, it was uh, De la post-colonie à la mondialisation, and the English translation uh, will be uh, uh, released soon, in some month, in set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, uh, for giving us that example of the uh, revival churches in Western uh, Africa, and you know, linking in some of the some of the key um, issues that were raised this morning. For example, cohesion, um, coercion, not cohesion, but cohesion, co coercion. Is that right? Yeah, coercion, yeah. Coercion. coercion. Yeah. Sounds funny. Uh, but also the importance of engaging women at the grassroots level as well as two, two very key important issues. Um, so now we will hear from uh, our next speaker, um, doc, Dr. Pius Adesani. And um, uh, Pius is a professor of department uh, of the Department of English Language and Literature and the Institute of African Studies here at Carleton. He is also one of Nigeria's celebrated columnists and public intellectuals. His book, uh, You're Not a Country, Africa, won the inaugural Penguin Prize for African Writing in Nonfiction Category in 2010. Uh, he's a widely cited uh, commentator on African affairs. Welcome. I'm not good. I just want to set off. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, no. For, for a short no, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> just to video you. Uh, yeah. Okay, you'll I'm do the same. Here. Okay. I'll, 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 but I'll have to come back and forth. Do you I'll, want I'll, I'll maybe me to change? Me. Yeah, I can do that. That's so important. Four years ago, I, I had given a, a, I had given a keynote at the Stand -up, uh, Stanford Forum for African Studies, and it was only halfway into my talk, into my speech, that I discovered that all my references, all my sources, everything was coming from Facebook and Twitter. And then I said, okay, the face of academic work is, is changing. What's the world coming to? <laughs> What's the world coming to when your references are coming from from social media? But um, that's what we have now. <laughs> While well, I do my introduction, um, Kimberly, when I give you this signal, we'll start with this album. Uh, just give you the show again. Okay, sure. Which one? We'll start with this. Okay. Yes, and then when I'm done, we'll okay. go to this. Yeah, sure. okay. And then I'll go to some other. Okay. Where do I have to? Whatever you want. Oh, just, just <laughs> I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> uh, so, I'm, in a way, I'm very happy, uh, and I, I have to thank uh, Shireen. Oh, yeah, <laughs> because uh, she's done the, the bulk of the ground clearing, and my my talk will be able to determine how it fits into fits off of yours and fits into it and all that. So I don't have to contextualize. 
um, so many things, especially in terms of um, the consequences and the economies of victimhood, female victimhood of um, uh, what I'm zooming in on here, you know, prosperity Pentecostal, uh, Pentecostalism, you know, which I'm describing as maybe the second wind of change blowing across the African continent, you know. Uh, for the entire discourse of the wind of change, you know, was uh, uh, evolved in the 1960s when, you know, in one fell swoop, everybody, you know, was getting independence from colonialism and all that. And the British Prime Minister said, okay, the wind of change, which is freedom. And I'm arguing, you know, after almost 15 years now of being on the road, you know, traveling across the continent and encountering this sweep of a certain kind of Christian fundamentalism across the continent. I've been looking into how it is not just producing uh, victims beyond our traditional conceptualizations of victimhood. What the, the prosperity it's, it's easy when we're taking of religious extremism, religious fundamentalism, and then the, 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 the normal victimhood we have in our heads is terrorism, the bombing, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, and this and that. Uh, but beyond that, what kinds and how does prosperity Pentecostalism victimize people and women? You know, and how is that you know spreading across the continent? And how do we uh, mitigated. But I'm looking beyond that. I'm looking at the spread of this phenomenon. You know, I'm looking at uh, the cultures it is producing. I'm looking at how it is shaping identities across the African continent. I'm looking at how it is shaping, enhancing, or impeding, you know, the position of the African modern-day post-colonial African citizen uh, in processes of governance in processes of democracy, in processes of civic participation. So I'm looking at a whole bunch of things. And I'm also looking or trying to account for how it is even shaping the African space. When you get out of the plane, for instance, and you get to Lagos, you get to Nairobi, you get to, uh, to Accra, you know, how, you know, what, what hits you? what hits you and why, both visually and sometimes, you know, or different. You know, so how is this, how is prosperity, Pentecostalism, reshaping African identities, producing new forms of sociality, new socialities, and producing victimhoods, you know. Uh, uh, so let's try to answer the first question by looking at these, these two buildings. One, they look identical, but they're, they're actually not. Let's take the first one. Uh, one's in Lagos and one is in Ibado. And that is what we... This is a three-story building in a residential area. And what do you notice? There are three different churches. There are three different churches occupying this building. There are three different churches, three different prosperity Pentecostal denominations. It's just taken random. You know. So we are in, in Lagos. Five years ago, when folks began to complain about the proliferation, because it's, it's almost uh, 10 churches, Every time you get up to a denomination of 200 people, they last for a, for a year. Once the once the the collections and the tithes, you know, get substantial, they break up and all that. So uh, we are getting to a point where even apartment buildings, because one of the Pentecostal pastors, pastors you know, notably went on national television and said, you know, what we are trying to do is not have hundreds of churches per block in the cities of Nigeria and Africa. We want to have two churches in every apartment. Two churches in every apartment, in every apartment building. So you've got three churches here, 
you know, and you know, RCCG, Redemption Faith, and Answer by Fire Ministries, these are very huge, huge ministries. So you can imagine what life is like for those living in these neighborhoods because there isn't too much regulation, you know. Uh, these days, you know, government makes an effort to control them, but you know, it never really works in terms of where you can set up a church. All you need is to wake up in your living room and gather four or five people and then name yourself a prosperity Pentecostal pastor and brand yourself, uh, buy some suits and start to look like an American televangelist and add what we call um, locally acquired American accent and you are in business. You are in business. You know, before you know it, you become, uh, <laughs> you become a billionaire or a multi-millionaire because what these churches are selling, are selling you know, the, the main pastors in Nigeria these days, uh, only the struggling pastors have one or two private jets. Those who are in real business these days, those who are in real business, three private jets, four private jets. One guy sold his, sold one of his, you know, last year because he wanted to cut expenses. So as prosperity Pentecostalism spreads across the continent like a wildfire, uh, unknown to many Canadians, you know, uh, it, there's also a linkage because Bombardier is a huge business, you know, they're the ones supplying most of those private jets to those passes. They're always ordered, always ordered. So folks are always coming to Montreal, there is that, that connection. Um, can you give me the second, can you give me the second, um, so you can see this one too. Uh, mountain of Fire is back. This, this was taken in Ibadan. And then you have another worship center and etc. So everywhere you go, the urban landscape, the urban landscape, pro prosperity Pentecostal denominations are breaking down the boundaries between commercial zones, residential zones, and all kinds of zones. No zone is respected in the contemporary African urban landscape. They're just everywhere. They're much women everywhere. And, um, but they're not just taking over buildings. They're not just taking over buildings. And that is what the next set of, because their visual power, their visual invasion. So there's, there is. Poster, um, fundamental oh, no. at the top. Fundamental of posters to the left. Yeah. yeah. So the marketing of, this brand, the marketing of this brand competes with Nollywood. You know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Nollywood posters and Nollywood, um, Nollywood flyers. If you, if you don't know what Nollywood is, that's, uh, that's the second largest female industry in the world now, actually. It used to be the first. But I understand uh, it's now between Bollywood, right? So there's, this is the Nigeria home video industry. And it's known for advertisement and posters and, pl and flyers, you know, which is um, uh, along with the flyers and posters of politicians. That used to be the you know, Nollywood and political posters and flyers used to be uh, the greatest menace to urban sanity that we used to have. But now it is the posters everywhere you are in Lagos, in cities, this sort of, and you can see, <laughs> You can just see some of the, uh, gradually we'll get into their message and into their modes of victimizing women, you know, because what they are doing, basically, uh, these forms of Christianity, basically what they are doing is they have replaced across the African continent, they have replaced the teachings of what we call the Orthodox Churches. Now, you are, uh, what Orthodox Churches mean here is different from what it means in Africa. When we say the Orthodox Churches in Africa, or Orthodox denominations, we are talking about Catholics, uh, Anglicans, the traditional Methodists, you know, Presbyterians, that's what we call the Orthodox Churches. Now, these guys arrived on the scene gradually as from the late 70s to the mid 80s and exploded in the 90s and now they are inescapable across the continent. So that if I say that they arose 
in the late 70s to the mid 80s, what does that coincide with across the continent? It coincides with the SAPs. It coincides with the structural adjustment programs of the World Bank and the IMF and the devastating consequences of the SAPs across the continent. Because uh, even before the SAPs, you already had very weak states. You already, you already had states that have been afflicted by all kinds of post-colonial contestations and the tensions between, you know, the nature of the African, the African post-colonial state is a product of the colonial state, and it inherited all the tensions, all the dysfunctions, and all that. Uh, so it was already, even before the SAPs, it, it, Immediately after independence, you know, the euphoria lasted in some cases five, six years, and things started to unravel. All kinds of fault lines that colonialism had papered over started to reemerge, and people started to contest this. Thing. So by the time you threw in the SAPs, it was poverty extravagance. It was, you know, the SAPs really brought in the globalization of hopelessness. You know, it was a democracy of hopelessness, poverty, and nature, they say, of course, a vacuum. So the African state literally withdrew from its own part of the social contract. And these, you know, the vendors of miracle, of prosperity, because what they sell is immediate solutions to all the regular problems occasioned by poverty. You know, are you ill? Miracle. Uh, employment? Miracle. Love, miracle. All the problems that you have that the state ought to respond to. Everything that your tax guarantees, basically here, yeah, because you pay taxes, you know, the state cannot do that enough. And these guys move in and they start selling this. And they supplant the teachings. So, so it's, a, it's a very attractive packaging and marketing. And you begin to see a sec. Uh, a sexual or a gender dimension to some of these messages in terms of, yeah, they are selling prosperity, but mostly they are also selling things which would target you that, you know. So, give me a spouse or I die. When they're talking about give me a spouse or idea, I die, and, and all those things, you know, talking about marriage, marriage as an imposition, marriage as a compulsion and all that, they're not mostly targeting the guys. It's a message designed for stigmatized women because in most of these societies, uh, 20, 21, not married, it's still fine, 22, 25, no fancy, not married, ah, it's, uh, oh sister, your miracle will come this year. I begin to hear that because uh, after 25, uh, no married, uh, uh, not good, not good. So stigmatization enters. Um, Kimberly, thanks. Uh, again, you can see this guy. And then, of course, now, these sometimes in cities, in cities across the country, because I've just condensed these images, you're getting out of the airport and you're seeing huge banners, you see billboards, you see, you know, they're everywhere. It's like political campaign season, but it's all year round. It's all year round, and you know it doesn't matter whether you are in Abidjan. If you are in Abidjan, what changes is the language. What changes is the language. If you are in Accra, in the you see. So this guy is also promising this beautiful sister must marry. Of course, victimization and victimhood then enters into what he is promising and what he is going to do with the female members of his denomination before they can get married. I will see some posters and some videos of certain things that have been happening on a very large scale across the continent. Sometimes it almost borders on, 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 on mass hypnosis of, of, of female followers of these guys. Okay? Um, okay, I, I threw this one in. This is another of the mega, of the mega pastors. <coughs> Uh, so all these guys, they really are billionaires. Like I've been saying, it's one of the richest guys uh, in the in the continent. To show you, sometimes the hold that they have 
over their over their congregation, over their followers. And sometimes why some of your work, and we'll get to that, you know, as NGOs and interventionist groups, uh, why it doesn't always work in terms of some of the campaigns you are you trying you trying to do. We'll, we'll see. So in the world of African prosperity Pentecostalism, your pastor is not even a pastor. With the Orthodox churches, you had your priest and you had your pastor or your minister who played the conventional roles we're familiar with here. In the world of prosperity Pentecostalism across the continent, your pastor is your daddy. You don't even say, in most cases, you know, daddy geo, daddy geo, daddy general overseer, mommy this, mommy that. And he is present. There is no he is present in every area of your life. The control is absolute. The control is total. So they worship him. In fact, part of the approach that we're using to demarcate the difference now between, uh, between the Orthodox churches and the new churches, which is sweeping the continent, is... The relationship to the pastor. It used to be possible when we were growing up to say the Bible says. The Christian would say the Bible says. But in these churches now across the continent, uh, if you listen very carefully, it's going to be very rare for you to hear the Bible says. The Bible says, or not. it's my pastor says. It is my pastor says. With prosperity Pentecostalism, it is the word of your pastor, which has completely erased. And, and so your pastor, his, his, his jets must be maintained, and all sorts of issues. Will, and then we'll see the consequences. Let's see the, the next one. Now, uh, we are coming to this guy la later, you see? Uh, this is not from, this could almost be, you could mistake this for a Nollywood, yeah. for a Nolly, all the hot girls, all the hot girls in Lagos attend Dr. Fireman's church. That is because there's a new subgeneration of churches. Prosperity Pentecostal churches, there's one mega one in Abuja, these guys in Lagos, targeting millennials, targeting the social media generation. So they're using social media, they're using Twitter, they are using the language which appeals to these girls. Most of them just undergraduates or senior high school age and all. So they're using the hip language of contemporary social media to catch them. And these girls flock to them, the hundreds of thousands, and most of them become sexual slaves and all kinds of scandals. So this is actually from a real billboard in Lagos because Dr. Sai Fireman is targeting a specific demographic. And you see people like him also in South Africa and across the continent targeting that. So they are very, very active on social media, recruiting girls. You know. So if you are not target, targeting girls for marriage, they want to solve your marriage solution, you're tar targeting them for, you know, literally sexual trafficking and all, you know, uh, uh, sexual trafficking. And of course, the worst of it all, there are three forms, dominant modes of female victimization and pro prosperity uh, Pentecostalism that have uh, identified. And I hope they, the worst of it all is um, the witchcraft problem, which I'm going to come to uh, very soon. So another slide. Aha. So we come to the world of heading Opadio. We come to the world of Helen Opadio. Um, she's not alone. She's just the most prominent of the Pentecostal people who are into uh, catching witches. And so, and when we are talking about witches here, we're, we're mostly talking about girl children. You know, hundreds, literally. Hundreds of thousands of girl children across the continent. She runs one of the biggest witchcraft 
ministries in the continent, out of Kala. And she's been, she's had run-ins with all kinds of international NGOs, activist organizations, and all that. Uh, recently she had, she had some trouble with the British government because Nigerians in diaspora, uh, she was going to have a crusade in London uh, in October last year, and, and Nigerians uh, all over the Western diaspora rose up and all that and started bombarding the British government. You know, we want you to revoke her visa. This is what she does to kids and all of that. Um, but I'm not sure it has worked. I'm not sure it has worked. The British government, but basically, so she runs this ministry in which you know, girls, sometimes as young as, you know, three year olds, are labeled witches. And um, in some, in most cases, especially in the villages when they go around, in the cities, in the cities, yeah, there are these cars and all that, but the girl children still escape with their lives in the cities. But when people like Helen Opabio take their ministries to the countryside, to the villages, which she does often, the identification of a young girl as a witch in the village is a death sentence. It's a death sentence. So everywhere Helen Opabio goes, girl children are dying. Beaten to death, stoned to death, you know. In the name of, and, and she's making millions, making millions. So she's 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 very wealthy. Uh, okay. uh, three is it? Three video clips. One from South Africa. One from Kenya. Bonus. And one from Nigeria, so that you understand. The continental scope of some of these problems that I've been talking about in terms of so that it's, it's not a Nigerian thing and then I'll return to Nigeria to problematize uh, some of the solutions that uh, okay let's take this first yeah. and then can you pause it yeah and then, yeah, then, sorry. So this South African mega prosperity pastor, he's been, he's been breaking the internet. That's the word this is when, when things go viral. He's been breaking the internet with his own modes of mass hypnosis and victimhood. You know, and again, his victims, I like to say victims because I, I can't, I know it's no longer the conventional things to say this, this uh, because we say that the word victim denies agents. There, there are just certain cases where you just don't know what to say. So this guy, uh, the whole range of the victimization of women after mass hypnosis, name it, it's there. It's there. But his latest antics this year was, um, you know, uh, ap apart from the many numbers of his female congregants that he slept with, or, or beating them, or jumping on stomachs of pregnant women, and all that. Is when he started to make them to eat grass. Eat grass. And eating grass is not just any kind of grass. Eating grass is literally ordering folks to go onto the moon, many of them women, and eat grass because he's saying he's demonstrating somehow the grace of God. And I, I don't. What's going on in prosperity from Pentecostal is not to be confused with some of the old models of mass hypnosis. This is not Reverend Jones in, in Guyana. This is not this is not Waco. This, this is not the cultic thing. No, these are uh, these are hypermodern 
Bible-based organizations that do, they do not behave like cults at all. They are open, they are, you can go there, you're welcome, and I know that, and they operate in full glare, you know, of the of the international community. So let's let's have great. But they're going to eat special bread before they eat this. If Jesus can turn water into one, fish into his body, huh? Loaves from the boy into what? Into what? Into his body. People can eat. So I'm going to give them food from above. And they're going to eat for this year, 2014. Huh? Huh? I think we are fasting. But they're going to eat the fourth meat from above. Wake up! Stop! second about the Kenyan guy. His own story is the female members, and you can Google this, I'm, I'm looking up my own. The female members of his congregation cannot receive the Holy Spirit if they attend church wearing bras and underwear. So henceforth, you must come, no underwear, no bra, and be ready to Hundreds of thousands of women are flocking to that denomination, braless and underwearless, and just sitting in front to see. Okay, so that's so forms of victim, victimhood. Again, we need to stop thinking in terms of the boom of of uh, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab. You know. What's happening to, it's easier to say Boko Haram has killed 1,000. You know, Al-Shabaab shot 137. What these Christian guys are doing across the continent, what they are causing, the figures, it's, it's not even computable. Who's done the, the numbers in terms of the girl children that have been killed in the South South? I don't know, you know, it's done the numbers in terms of homes destroyed, lives broken. Uh, three weeks ago, <laughs> one pastor in Nigeria impregnated almost 50 members of his, and, and the, the costs are just one. This guy, let's start with this. Yeah. Eric Carlson is more than just a hockey player. He's actually a professional car <laughs> Welcome. In the name of Jesus. You've been there for how long? Can you pause it? I'm your witch for Jesus. First, you have to. Okay. So this this guy uh, is also one of the wealthiest. He's the guy who so who, who, who felt that it was um, outrageous for him to have. Um, Four private jets. So in order to be closer to Jesus, he sold one. So he has only three left now. He holds a global empire. But last year he doubled. He invaded Helen Opabio's territory. And in one of these funny things, I understand that there was some kind of tough competition between them when he started dabbling into witchcraft ministry and catching witches and all that. But he got him into because Nigeria and this. Increasingly, Nigeria has a very activist diaspora, and and part of what my own grounds with the 
with the Western NGO community is that sometimes they, they try to do interventions in Africa without reckoning with the diasporas of the countries they are, they are dealing with. So there is a disconnect. You, know, you, you want to go into Nigeria and deal with guys like this. What has the Nigerian diaspora been doing about guys like this in terms of trying to get visa restrictions, trying to send them out of hotel rooms in London, U.S. are blockading them in Toronto and creating awareness. You know, there's no coordination of, of effort. So this guy gets into into which <laughs> which guy, and this got him into into. I think we were able to get his um, American visa. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of um, petitions and letters and. And stop, but let's see what he does to a girl child. Jesus. You've been there for how long? I'm not in witch. I'm a witch for Jesus. I'm my own witch Jesus. You are a foul devil. Do you know who you're talking to? Foul devil. So, can you stop it? So he slaps this girl, it goes viral online, and Nigerians from London to the US to Australia, everywhere, rose up and put in pressure. Uh, one lawyer sued him in the US. And, uh, but let's see his reaction to the agitation in the next. Let's see his reaction to the agitations against him. Isn't that yeah. Let's hear him. Yoga is essentially understanding. <laughs> Aligning your system with the cosmos. <laughs> 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 Too complicated. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Some fellow said, you know, um, uh, that Bishop slapped a witch. What is it what it's about? You know how many people witches have been slapping? And uh, what is your problem? Because I stopped the witch and the witch came to apologize. What's your problem? Amen. If I say another one, I will slap him again. It's my ministry to slap him. People who relate to witches is my ministry. Amen. I must answer the call of God on my mind. Amen. Okay. So that was basically. Now, why is he able to do this? Despite the international backlash and all the noise we made. Because when you get to this level in prosperity Pentecostalism, you control precedence. You, I, I can show you pictures. No politician of consequence, nobody in governance in Africa does anything without going to these guys. One of them, one of the, who literally controls the government of Ghana, from his base in Lagos, Prophet T.B. Joshua is mm. And also has a ministry that disproportionately victimizes women. I was surprised to get to Ghana and see how huge the guy is. Successive Ghanaian presidents, ministers. On a given Sunday, the Ghanaian government literally flies to Lagos to worship at the feet of this guy. I'm, 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 I'm done. <laughs> so, they are in cahoots with this thing. This guy, uh, South Africans, South Africans, mostly black South Africans, you know, plain loads of them every Sunday, they fly to worship with T.B. Joshua. So T.B. Joshua also runs a huge hotel business. Uh, but it was supposed to be, his hotel building was supposed to be two stories, but because of the impunity and protection they enjoy from God, all these prosperity pastors. He added four more stories without permit and nothing. So it was a disaster waiting to happen. Lo and behold, last year that disaster happened and the building collapsed. His illegal building collapsed, killing the greatest number of South African citizens to have died outside of South Africa in their modern history. Almost 200 South Africans died. The efforts of the South African government to at least 
because I've, I've got journalists and friends in South Africa who are media organizations, SABC, City Press, Milan Guardian, and people were emailing me here, what's going on? Can you talk? Do you know the Nigerian ambassador in, in, in High Commissioner? Yeah, I know him. Can you talk to him? We cannot get visas. To go, this is a major tragedy for us in South Africa. We can't get visas to go and cover this disaster in Lagos. Can you? And then I call the High Commissioner and he laughs. <laughs> he laughs and says, Why are you talking like you are no longer in Nigeria? I can't do anything. I can't give them visas. Order from Abuja. Abuja is shielding the past. The president is shielding the pastor from international scrutiny. If these international media people come in, you know, they are going to poke their noses everywhere and ask stupid questions from my friend, the pastor, and all that. We can't let that happen. So I'm order those from the presidency in Abuja. No media organizations are coming in to disturb the prophet. So, if the Nigerian president snobs the South African government, an NGO in Canada, you notice these things, you want to go and intervene. They are not only going to snub you, they are going to crush you because they are going to give a message to Ottawa to John Harper. Did I just say John Harper? They are going to give a message to him that these inquiries would affect. They have a way of saying that the Nigerian High Commission, that the old one had a way of of me that it would affect our bilateral relations. And, and, and you lose funding and you lose everything. So, so the key is to think in terms of what can be done. How can you move beyond the wall of official protection to save these victims? Because they are mass, it's, it's massive across the continent. You know, pregnancies, lynchings, killings, burnings. Oh, well. Because they are witches, they are this, they are that, all kinds of taboos that these mega pastors are placing on them across the continent. How do you do? So th there needs to be a synergy of efforts and collaboration between interventionist NGOs here and diaspora communities of respective African countries, you know, who are very active bridges between what's going on the ground and what we're trying to do here. And it's only in doing that. And I've, I've seen that work in, 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 in certain cases, especially in the case of, of Helen Okwabi. Uh, Victor, my friend, who, who was supposed to give this talk because I was happy just be a co-organizer with Blair and um, with Blair and Kimberly, but Victor couldn't make it. Uh, Victor is from Helen Opabios. He's one of Nigeria. Victor Epo, one of Nigeria's biggest artists, you know, painters, and he's based in the U.S. Been profiled by CNN, New York Times, and all that. So part of his activist work is to go after Helen Opabio. Uh, he's received death threats to his life and, and stuff like that. But he's working is working with NGOs, you know, based out of the US and, and in London. So we need to think along the lines of strategic uh, collaborations between the diaspora communities and NGOs in order to begin to look at how to resolve some of these issues. And the biggest resolution we even need is a mental shift, because here in the West when we think of the victims of fundamentalism, the instinct, the gesture is to still think of the victims of Islamic fundamentalism. So that these ones are entirely silenced because we both hear the boom. Thank you.